Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're almost through module two. So today we're gonna to talk about physiology. So dinosaur uh, morphology, shape, how they're built, and a little bit about their senses, the five senses. Uh, then on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about ectothermic versus endothermic, uh, or maybe in between. And then we're gonna be done and remember the midterms on Friday. So before we get into today, so with that said, let's go review what we talked about last time. Uh, so we talked about nesting and growth, things that we can't necessarily, or we just, we can't observe directly in dinosaurs. There's no living dinosaurs, although birds are uh, non, are, are avian dinosaurs. So uh, how do we tell what dinosaur like nesting and growth was like? So one way to do this is by looking at the behaviors in birds, which are more derived, and crocodiles, which are more basal to infer what the dinosaur behavior is because again, they're located in between on this tree. So what do we call that? How do we, what, what do we call that method of investigation? So I'll give you a couple seconds to look at it. Three, two, one, a zero. So we call that phylogenetic bracketing. Uh, if you said cladistics, cladistics how you build the tree, uh, phylogenetic bracketing is taking something that's farther down the tree, more derived, something farther back on the tree, more basal, and something that's in between. So any features that are shared between birds and crocodiles are probably present in the in-between dinosaurs. And now obviously there are exceptions to that. So like for example, pterosaurs fall in between as well. And we know that birds and crocodiles both laid hard calcareous shelled eggs, but pterosaurs didn't. There's also some evidence that some dinosaurs didn't, but in general, it's a good way of kind of investigating it. Um, functional morphology, if you, if you said that, that's kind of right. Uh, we can look at living birds, how they work. We can look at living crocodiles, how they work, living analogs to try to compare back, but really it's phylog phylogenetic bracketing. Uh, so the next question, an organism that produces a large amount of offspring, like these turtles here, uh, likely devotes uh, how much energy to parental care? So give you a couple seconds. Uh, and the answer is uh, minimal to really, in this case of the sea turtles, zero. So again, that kind of, and it's not a hard and fast rule, but the more offspring there are, the less the parents tend to be involved. So like, again, like oysters, they broadcast their gametes into the water, it's fertilized and they kind of drift away. They're not even in the same area, well, kind of the same general area as the parents, but obviously the parents don't participate in their lives and they don't take any care. Uh, sea turtles lay their eggs, and they leave, and so they don't have any influence on the care of the young, and the young are kind of left on their own. Once they hatch, they need to find their way to the sea, and we've probably all seen those videos of some of the young not making it to the sea. Uh, contrast that to penguins, which have a low amount of young, and you see this very high level of parental care, and so we know kind of in general how many eggs dinosaurs tend to lay, it's on the order of 12 or so, which is more than penguins, but less than sea turtles. So their amount of parental care is likely somewhere in between. Uh, okay, so let's talk about dinosaur physiology. So it's really all about kind of bringing dinosaurs to life. So how do we go from the hard part, skeletons, the bones, how do we go from the fossil record bones that we have, how do we kind of restore those back to life. And what we see is that people have been trying to do this uh, right from the very beginning. So as soon as you find these really fascinating, large, very, very much unlike something that's living today, uh, what did that thing look like? And so people have been trying to reconstruct that. So uh, this is, these are the dinosaur sculptures from the Crystal, uh, Crystal Palace, uh, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, these are iguanodons. Uh, and you can see that the kind of model in mind at this time was very much the kind of slow plotting lizard-like model. And so that kind of thinking evolves through time. And so this is kind of, again, 
very lizard-like, uh, maybe a little more active in time. And now through the 1960s, and especially since the 1980s and into today, uh, really kind of a more active model where we're starting to question the dogma that these things even are cold-blooded, which again, we'll talk about on Wednesday, but um, very much more active, more dynamic, uh, more readily moving around. And so all of these paleo art pieces were an attempt to really kind of bring dinosaurs back to life. And each of them is a hypothesis. So every time that you try to put the flesh back on the bones with some sort of representation here, you're making a hypothesis. You're making an educated guess as to what that animal actually looked like in life. Now, unfortunately, we'll probably never be able to test out to see which one is actually right, but there are a lot of pieces of evidence that we can point to that at least lead us to believe that this model here is a lot more accurate than this model. We talked a little bit about trackways. Uh, this kind of model, you would see tail dragging a lot with the trackways. Uh, we don't see that. Here you see that sort of, uh, it's in a kind of quadrupedal stance on all fours right now, but it definitely has the ability to at least occasionally come up on bipedal. We see that again in trackways. So we're not entirely flying blind here, but all of these reconstructions are hypotheses and they're all right and wrong to various degrees. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we put the flesh back on the bones? So again, uh, one of the key points in this class is that the fossil record, what makes it through, what is preserved and makes it into museums or into collections and universities for study is heavily biased towards the hard, part, hard parts like the skeletons and teeth. Uh, in the case of dinosaurs, it's almost entirely the hard parts like the skeletons and teeth. There's very, very few uh, skin impressions, feather impressions, uh, evidence of coloration. This is almost always lost to the fossil record. And so how do we figure that kind of stuff out? Uh, this stuff that we have less data for is often a little bit less certain, a lot less certain really. Uh, in many ways, it is just kind of taking educated guesses. And if we find better preserved soft parts, which is unlikely but not impossible, uh, we will update our hypotheses, our reconstructions to suit that. Uh, the musculature and the stance of these organisms is a little bit less speculative uh, because you can actually see on the hard parts evidence of how the muscles attached. And also there's limitations on how big the musculature would be. For example, the jaw muscles have to go through those holes in the skulls. And so there's, there's a restriction there. And you know that it probably filled that entire space. And so you can get a really good estimate on that. So like uh, the homework last weekend was the bite force of T-Rex. Uh, how did they know what the bite force of T-Rex was? Well, uh, we know what the hard part anatomy of the jaw looks like. We have entire skulls of T-Rex. And we know how in modern organisms, the jaw musculature attaches. And we can see evidence of that in the fossil record. And so we can reconstruct that. Uh, they happen to use a 3D computer model to do that. Uh, there are some more practical models like with hydraulics and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the same kind of concept here. Um, we're looking at evidence from the skeleton. We're looking at any small hints that we can to try to reconstruct this thing. This is a very common technique in forensic science. So if there is a very old cold case and all we have left are the skeletal remains, there are facial reconstruction artists that will actually try to reconstruct what the face looked like uh, from the skull, from just the skeletal material. Uh, we can also hypothesize things like build and things from there, but um, facial reconstruction is very important to try to identify the victim. And so how do we do that? Uh, again, there's no soft parts left here, but we know how the musculature attaches in human faces. Uh, we know how thick the fat and the skin tends to be in different areas. And so we're able to kind of reconstruct with reasonable fidelity, uh, reasonable enough fidelity that it often does actually help to solve crimes uh, that it, 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 it works to some degree. Uh, and so we use these very similar techniques to go from the entire skeleton of a dinosaur 
and we start trying to put meat back on the bones, start trying to build the musculature. Once you have the musculature built, which you're relatively confident in, then you can start putting like the fat layer on, start putting skin on. Uh, and then the big debate comes, okay, we've got this animal, we've got it skinned. There's a lot of arguments about exactly what that might have looked like. But the real problem comes in with like the coloration or the feathers. Is it feathered or not? Is it feathered only over certain portions? Uh, this is where it really becomes speculative because we have scant evidence of skin, very little evidence of coloration and little to no evidence of feathers in most dinosaurs, but they certainly exist. And we have documentation in some earlier specimens. We know that birds more advanced have feathers. So in between, did they have feathers? Did all of them have feathers? How many feathers did they have? What types of feathers? Where were they feathered? Uh, we'll talk about that next time, but just know that. So this is, again, it's paleo art. Each one of these renditions is a hypothesis based on some amount of data, but we have to fill in some gaps with our imagination. And by looking at living analogs and by looking at whatever small evidence we have to try to fill in the gaps, uh, so one common source of error, or I should say obvious error, in some of these reconstructions is that uh, many of these renditions of dinosaurs kind of take the skeleton and they'll just kind of shrink wrap the skin over the skeleton. So kind of like a vacuum seal right onto the skeleton where there's not a lot of fat, not a lot of muscle. And so uh, it, it, the animal doesn't really even work. So if we attempt to reconstruct some modern organisms in a similar way, uh, you get these very, uh, frankly, nightmarish <laughs> creatures here. So this is what a hippo would look like uh, if we recreated it in a way that some paleo art reconstructions of dinosaurs are. Uh, you'll notice that the skin is very tightly shrink wrapped onto the bone. Uh, you see these kind of projections here at the cheeks. Uh, they're kind of almost being like little uh, genal like cheek spines here or horns. Uh, those are muscle attachments. Uh, you see that there is no jaw muscles drawn in here. The, the face here is too lean to have any muscles to allow the jaw to articulate. This doesn't work. This jaw would not work. There's no muscles to open it. There's no muscles to close it. It's too shrink wrapped. Uh, you see the very prominent eye ridges that's not something that we really recognize from hippos because it's inside the cranium. It's, it's covered in muscle and fat and skin. And so they do have like little extent of prominent outjuts there, but it's not pointy like this. Uh, and the other obvious thing is that when a hippo has its mouth closed, uh, you can't really see these giant tusks that are inside here. And so the, the, the lips, the, the cover over these things. And so this is not at all what a hippo looks like. Uh, same thing with a zebra here. Uh, they've shrink wrapped it so tightly that there is no fat. Everything, there's really not even room for organs. We know that zebras are herbivores. They need that massive gut to process all that food that they're eating. Uh, this is not what a zebra looks like. Again, uh, we have the luxury of knowing that zebras are covered in fur. Uh, and they have that very di distinctive white and black stripe pattern that would not be obvious from the fossil record unless there was an extraordinary preservation of a zebra specimen. Uh, again, like the, the ears, the horse-like ears that we associate with zebras, those are soft parts, uh, very unlikely to be preserved. And so they're not present here on this reconstruction. You see the teeth are exposed, the gums, uh, the, the, the uh, they're, they're, the, the, the lips are not on there, they are not preserved, and so you kind of have this like kind of buck tooth looking zebra here. Uh, same thing with swans. Uh, swans, again, we see the neck on the swans. They This artist has drawn this as like this sweeping S-curve kind of noodle neck. Uh, we know that swan necks are pretty flexible, but they don't do this. Uh, they don't do this sweeping S-curve with almost no structure, just kind of flopping limply around. Uh, they would break their necks if this was the case. Uh, they're also kind of drawn with these dagger-like or scythe-like forelimbs. Uh, in this book, uh, it's called, I think it's called All Yesterdays, 
uh, it's drawn, they're drawn as like stabbing with for fish with these front limbs here. That's like the alternate interpretation of this. And we know that that's not what swans do. Uh, so again, uh, if we were to try to reconstruct the swan from the fossil record without the luxury of having seen a swan with all of its muscle, all of its fat, all of its plumage, all of its organs, all of its soft tissues, all of its feathers, uh, this is what we might come up with. And the baboon is probably the most nightmarish of all, kind of this crazy alien looking thing with these very prominent fangs. Again, in baboons, the, the, the lips kind of cover over the, the, the really vicious kind of mandibles of these baboons. Uh, and you see they very tightly shrink wrapped on here. Again, not a lot of room for musculature in the limbs. And so you get these very kind of elongate, uh, kind of too fragile looking limbs and also not a lot of room for internal organs. So the shrink wrapping can be problematic and we see the consequences of doing it if we were to try to apply it to real living organisms. Uh, people are getting better and more aware of this problem with paleo artist reconstructions. And so we're, we're kind of getting better and better at this over time. Um, but this is definitely a problem in a lot of paleo art. Uh, so this kind of raises the question, like, uh, are we way off on some dinosaur appearances? Like, uh, these are not even really recognizable as the modern animals without the labels here. Uh, are we that far off on dinosaurs where we wouldn't really recognize if we had the luxury of seeing one in person versus the, recon the kind of general consensus reconstruction that we see? Are there any that are so far off like this that we wouldn't even really be able to recognize them? So for example, this is just kind of like a fun little thought experiment, but uh, as we know, the theropod line of dinosaurs gave rise to the bird lineage. T-Rex is on that theropod line. So let's take this to its logical uh, conclusion here. Uh, this is kind of like the chickadee body frame, the, you know, the chubby chickadee, the black and white bird there. Uh, let's apply that to T-Rex and uh, you get kind of this pretty funny result. Now, obviously, I don't think anyone interprets that this is what actually what T-Rex looks like but it's not outside the realm of possible outcomes. The feathers are not preserved. The coloration is not preserved. The fat and musculature is not fully preserved. It's not preserved to reconstruct this. So uh, we have issues with this. The, the feet here, again, the bones in the feet, the claws are preserved, but what exactly did the feet look like? We know a little bit from footprints, but um, it's, it's difficult. So it's probably not this difficult. Um, but it's just interesting to think about uh, how little it's possible that we know about these things. Uh, one of the more recent arguments uh, that came up online, uh, I follow a lot of Twitter feeds, and so there was a big back and forth about dinosaur lips recently. Uh, so one fairly prominent theme in paleo art reconstructions of dinosaurs is that the carnivorous dinosaurs uh, very often have their teeth kind of fully exposed, kind of for dramatic effect. Like, oh my gosh, look at those, look at those horrible teeth. Uh, or they're shown like kind of roaring with the mouth open. So you can see in full glory, uh, all of those, that vis vicious battery of teeth. Uh, it adds, it definitely adds dramatic impact. I'm not gonna lie about that, it certainly does. Uh, but how common actually is that? So uh, think about all the modern organisms that you can that have, really large teeth. So th start thinking about some big carnivores. So like wolves, lions, all of the big cats, alligators, crocodiles, big carnivorous predators. Uh, how many of those can you actually see the teeth when their mouths are closed? Uh, really only in the crocodiles and alligators. And so that kind of exposed teeth where the teeth are just kind of hanging out is really kind of more the exception than the rule, especially in modern animals. So uh, is that the case for dinosaurs as well? So uh, here's a good example of, it's called a butterfly lizard. And this is a paleo art reconstruction of what we might do to reconstruct this skull. And you see those teeth, uh, well, obviously these teeth are so large, they're going to be hanging out. Well, if you see a living example of this lizard, 
Uh, there's no way to really know that those teeth are even there until it opens up its mouth. If you Google some in images of this, uh, it has some pretty impressive fangs, uh, just like lions do. But when a lion's mouth is closed, uh, you can't see those fangs. Even like a house cat or a dog, they have some pretty impressive canine teeth. But when the mouth is closed, you don't see that. They have lips that cover over it. So uh, were dinosaurs kind of more like crocodiles or alligators here? Or were they kind of more like this lizard? How can we possibly tell? Well, if we look at a T-Rex jaw, the kind of the jawline here is pretty sharp and smooth. That is not what we see in alligators. Uh, it is what we see in this lizard here. Uh, there's also this pattern of foramina, these little dots here that in modern animals mark where the gums and where the lips start. And so there's a lot of good evidence here that T-Rex uh, probably did have uh, nice full pouty lips. Uh, so these are some reconstructions here of T-Rex as completely lipless with the teeth entirely exposed all the time, something that we mostly only see in aquatic animals or at least semi-aquatic animals. Uh, there's the partially lipped reconstruction here where uh, like the top row is kind of pointing out a little bit. Uh, and then there's the fully lipped version here where you don't see the teeth at all unless the mouth is open. Uh, for a T-Rex, for any carnivore, their teeth are their lifestyle. Their teeth are their life. If their teeth are damaged, they're not going to be able to feed themselves. They're not going to be able to live. They're not going to be able to compete. And so they want to protect those teeth. And so hanging them out in the environment at all times is a pretty bad idea. And so fully lipped is probably the model. That's what we see more frequently in living animals. There's even been some reconstructions of like saber tooth tigers that normally we see those big prominent saber teeth kind of sticking out. Uh, we start drawing like some pouches for the teeth now. And again, there's kind of like a big argument back and forth about that. But Again, if we want to know what the soft parts of these animals looked like, look to the modern, for example. And the T-Rex probably was uh, more lipped, at least, than it's usually drawn. The teeth were probably not fully exposed at all times. Uh, so that's one end of the dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, what about the other end? So it's not something that we often think about, uh, but what about the butt? <laughs> so. Uh, if we do phylogenetic bracketing, if we look at bird birds and crocodiles, dino again, dinosaurs are intermediate in between those, uh, birds and crocodiles both have cloacas. Uh, in dinosaurs, this wasn't, it's almost always not preserved. Again, it's soft tissue. Um, but in birds and crocodiles, the cloaca is this kind of all-purpose uh, opening for defecation, urination, and breeding. So it's like this one-stop shop of uh, everything going in and out. Uh, so uh, this recent specimen here uh, caused quite an uproar here, uh, Cetacosaurus. Uh, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> um, but there's a fossil here. It's an early Ceratopsian. And uh, one special feature about this particular fossil is that it seems to have uh, the cloaca preserved. Uh, you can even see some of the kind of skin imprints on here. This is exceptional preservation of some soft tissue, a very rare, uh, in this case, a unique glimpse at the soft tissue structure. And so we see a lot of features here that we see in modern day animals, uh, kind of this bump out front, uh, sort of lobes on each side, uh, probably scent glands as well. And so this was probably something that uh, there was probably some coloration there, as we see in modern organisms. Definitely scent was a thing. Uh, they were probably communicating with scent and with color, uh, just as we see in modern organisms. But this is a glimpse, a rare glimpse into uh, <laughs> something that we don't usually think about. But it's a very important part of their lifestyle, obviously. Uh, everybody poops, as the book says. So how? <laughs> this is a glimpse at. How that works. So uh, if we're going to talk about dinosaurs, though, the obvious questions about their physiology is like, why did they get so large? So if you're going to get large, there's probably some good reason, some advantage of getting this large. 
And so again, one of the big questions that we ask is if dinosaurs are so large, uh, why don't we see animals like this today? Why don't modern animals get this large? So one idea is that back in the Mesozoic, we talked about Mesozoic climate earlier. Uh, at the beginning of the Mesozoic, it was dry because of Pangaea, but it eventually got warmer and wetter. And so uh, it was eventually cooled off a little bit, but it was a hotter than it is today and a little bit more humid in most cases. Uh, it was a hot house environment, whereas we're in an ice house environment right now. Uh, it is warming, but there are still ice sheets present on Earth, on Antarctica and on Greenland, hopefully for a long time, but uh, the rate is not trending in the right direction. Uh, but uh, these high atmospheric CO2 levels in the Mesozoic led to increased plant productivity. Uh, there are actually some benefits to a warmed globe, but remember that all of human civilization and all of our major cities and everything was developed in an ice house environment. And so while there are some advantages to the hot house, they're generally not advantages that suit us as that's not what we developed. It's not what we evolved for. It's not what our civilization is based upon. Uh, but uh, plants were more productive. And so there was just more vegetation around per unit area. And so because the vegetation was thicker and more lush, uh, it could sustain larger herbivores. And if, so if you have larger herbivores, you're going to have to have the carnivores get bigger. So one advantage of getting really big for an herbivore is that it makes you a lot harder to take down. It requires a lot bigger carnivore to take you down. And so the carnivores have to kind of respond in kind by getting larger. And so there's kind of this arms race between predator and prey. As the prey get larger, the predators have to get larger. As the predators get larger, the prey has to get larger. And so it's kind of just fueling this ever increasing size. Uh, so these are some sizes of these large sauropod Mesozoic herbivores compared to African elephant, which is the largest land animal today. And as you see, uh, they just dwarf the elephant. The elephant is very small compared to these dinosaurs. These dinosaurs can be the mass of an entire herd of elephants, just one individual. Uh, again, with the carnivores, we see a pretty similar story. Uh, Lions are very large land carnivores. Uh, compared to the size of a T-Rex though, uh, they're insignificant. They're very small compared to the size of a Mesozoic carnivore. T-Rex are among the largest of the carnivores, but uh, they're certainly by no means alone in being that large. And there's lots of large carnivores that are much bigger than a lion, which is one of the largest carnivores on Earth today. Uh, what we see here, these are some different formations. So the Morrison formation, dinosaur pork formation, we'll talk about these later on in the class, these examples here. Uh, but this is showing you a ratio uh, of body mass between the herbivore and the carnivore, herbivore, carnivore, herbivore, carnivore. Uh, if we look at the Serengeti, uh, which is kind of the closest analog that we have to the Mesozoic where there's a very large herbivore, the elephants, giraffes, very large herbivores, uh, and some very large carnivores, the lions, uh, the ratio of 1.58. Uh, if we go back to the Mesozoic though, uh, especially here in the dinosaur park formation, the ratio is 1.06. So this means that the herbivores and the carnivores are uh, actually very close to each other in body mass, the closer you get to one, the closer they are to being the same. Uh, and so dinosaur uh, ecosystems tended to have the carnivores and the herbivores being a lot closer in size than, than more modern environments did. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. So why is that the case? Uh, one idea is that dinosaur food webs might have been a little bit flatter than most modern food webs. Uh, this could be an artifact of the fossil record, but we kind of have, so here's the base level primary producers, the plants, they're directly capturing energy from the sunlight. Uh, and right away, the first rung on the ladder here, the first tier are already very large herbivores, which are then consumed by very large carnivores. Uh, we're kind of skipping a tier here. 
uh, we're kind of skipping that intermediate tier where the, the smaller organisms like say um, uh, birds and smaller mammals are kind of eating the plants and then other things are eating them. Uh, we're kind of skipping that rung in a lot of the dinosaur ecosystems or apparently skipping that rung. So uh, these critters that would fall into this kind of small to intermediate size range are less likely to be fossilized than these very large animals. So uh, it's possible that it's a function of the fossil record not being complete and we just don't have those organisms, but it seems to be a consistent pattern over a lot of different times, a lot of different places. And so it probably is real, but we have to take it with a grain of salt. Always have to consider the biases in the fossil record. Uh, but in like a modern deciduous forest, again, we have like the primary producers down here, the plants, uh, the primary consumers. Uh, then we have kind of secondary consumers that eat them, the carnivores. And then we have other things that eat them. And so it's more layered. And again, at every layer, you lose energy to heat and just loss of energy with the hunting. Uh, so modern flatter food webs are the ones that contain larger animals. So like the Serengeti is a little bit more flat than this one. And so we see kind of more similar to the dinosaurs, but still a little bit different. So what are some limits to organism size? So the dinosaurs are obviously very massive, and that's one of the things that fascinates people about them. Uh, how big could they have gotten? So when we think about limits to size and mass, uh, there's very real physical limits to this. One of them is the relationship of the length of the bones, which correlates to the height of the animal, the length of the animal, uh, to the volume of the animal, which is like the mass of the animal. So if we look at bones, and that's one of the limitations of all terrestrial tetrapod animals is that we build our support structures out of bone. And we build bones in different ways, but the fundamental material is the same. There's no animals that build bones out of steel. There's no animals that build bones out of carbon microfibers. Uh, so we're all kind of restricted by the strength of bone. And so as the shape of the bone changes, the mass of the bone changes. But uh, if you make the bone twice as long, uh, the volume of the bone actually increases by the cube. So if you make something twice as long, twice as tall, uh, you're actually going to increase the weight by eight times two cubed. And so a lot of horror movies feature like really gigantic bugs. Uh, if you scaled an ant up to this size, uh, who knows what proportion that is, but you would have to cube that to get the mass. Let's say that's a thousand times bigger than an ant. Uh, you would cube that a thousand times a thousand is a million times a thousand is a billion. It would be a billion times heavier. And the exoskeleton of the ant wouldn't hold itself up. It would literally crumble into goo. Uh, same thing with robots. Uh, there's a lot of very large robots in fiction. So like Optimus Prime, uh, there's no human on here for scale, but Optimus is, I don't know, five or six people high, something like that. Uh, some of the Pacific Rim robots are much bigger than that. Uh, Voltron scale varies wildly depending on the episode, but uh, very large. Uh, these robots, unless they're made out of some material that we have no idea what it is that's much stronger than steel, but also much lighter than steel, uh, they would crumple under their own weight. There's a limit to how big these things can be for the materials that they're using. And so Pacific Rim robots, uh, unless it's some ridiculous material that we've not even dreamt of yet, uh, they couldn't exist. They're too large. Uh, same thing with dinosaurs. If we want to make a dinosaur that's much bigger than dinosaurs that we know existed, uh, we're going to start button up against this limit. Uh, sauropods are probably, uh, the largest of the sauropods are probably right up against this limit. And that's probably why they didn't get any bigger. They're the largest terrestrial animals to ever walk the earth. 
uh, and they probably got as big as tetrapod body form probably allows them to. Uh, if we started developing like eight legs or built our skeletons out of different materials, then you could probably support something bigger. But again, remember there's limits to our different shapes. Not all different shapes are possible. Uh, so how did dinosaurs get so large? Uh, if you just took an elephant and you scaled it up to the size of a sauropod dinosaur, uh, it would just crumple under its own weight. So how can dinosaurs do it? Uh, I just told you that they build it with the same kind of bone. So how come elephants couldn't do it, but dinosaurs could? Uh, well, one thing is that sauropod dinosaurs, the large uh, apatosaurs, argentinosaurs, dreadnoughtus, all those big, uh, uh, all those giant herbivores, uh, they have hollow uh, pneumatized bones. And when I say hollow, it's not like a pipe. There's kind of this network of cavities in here with kind of these rigid supports. Uh, but their bones are much lighter, but they're still strong. Uh, birds actually use this in breathing and dinosaurs probably did as well. So there's not only do birds have lungs, but they also have a series of air sacs. And these air sacs are actually plumbed into their bones. And so dinosaurs had, or at least the largest of these dinosaurs, had air-filled hollow bones. Uh, and they also had very large extensive air sacs inside their body to further reduce their mass. So in el to scale an elephant up to a sauropod, you would have to make its bones hollow. And you'd also have to make a lot of its interior body cavity full of air to lighten its density. Uh, that's how you can get dinosaurs so large. And that's why elephants can't. Uh, another thing that kind of limits uh, mammal size is that you know mammals are warm-blooded and we have to get rid of excess heat. So elephants, if you ever go to a zoo, uh, you'll often see elephants like throwing dirt up onto their backs or throwing water onto their backs. They're trying to cool off. They're trying to get rid of heat. Uh, that's why they have those big floppy ears to try to radiate heat away. Uh, it's a big problem for elephants because they're so large. Giraffes are, also have a very similar issue. They're very large body weight. Uh, very large body size, how do they get rid of heat? Uh, so one thing that dinosaurs could have done probably better is not only were they lighter, uh, they, their respiratory systems probably allowed them to dump excess heat uh, more efficiently. So not only did they have those air series of air sacs uh, connected in with the bone pathways, uh, but they also had these really large sinuses that would allow for really effective heat exchange uh, allowing them to really dump a lot of excess heat out. So like an elephant, if an elephant was covered in fur in today's environment, it would die, it would overheat. If we put a coating of feathers on the elephant, it would overheat. So some of the larger dinosaurs, if we put a coating of feathers on them, uh, maybe they would overheat, but they have all these different ways of making them lighter and allowing them to get rid of heat. So maybe something as big as a T-Rex could have feathers, uh, maybe not. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, another question that comes up is, uh, especially with the sauropod dinosaurs, is how do they pump blood? Uh, this is another adaptation that allows them to be very large. Uh, to be very large, there are going to be parts of your body that are really far away from your heart, and you have to get the blood there because you need to get the oxygen to there. Um, so sauropod dinosaurs have really big hearts and really high blood pressure. Uh, this is something that we see in giraffes. Again, looking at a modern analog, hmm, how does this ancient animal have such a long neck and still make it work? Well, let's look at a living animal that has such a long neck and still makes it work. So one way that giraffes do it is they have a really big heart relative to their body size, and they also have extraordinarily high blood pressure, uh, the highest blood pressure in the animal kingdom because their heart has to get the blood all the way up to their head, uh, especially when the head is way up on the neck, way up in the air. Uh, if you've ever stood up too fast, you know the consequences of not getting blood to your brain. You kind of get lightheaded, and in some cases, you can actually pass out. Uh, another thing that giraffes have is they actually have one-way valves in their neck uh, veins and arteries that keeps blood going in one way, so that if the giraffe does like reach way up, or put its head down below its heart. Uh, it doesn't just have this massive rush of blood to its head. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, they also have a kind of neck muscle tissue that's very spongy. 
And as it contracts and relaxes, it actually acts as sort of a passive pump. This is probably something that was also present in the sauropod dinosaurs. Again, the, the soft parts here are not preserved. Uh, we can see some evidence of this in the skeleton, some hints that it exists, uh, but this is all just from modern analogs. Okay, so that's kind of like dinosaur size. Uh, what about their senses? Uh, there's no hard part preservation for dinosaur senses. So the five senses, touching, hearing, smell, taste, sight, uh, or I should say very little. Uh, everything we know about dinosaur senses is from reconstructing dinosaur brains. And again, we don't have any intact dinosaur brains. They're soft tissue. They degrade very quickly. Uh, what we do have is the 3D cavity that the brain was in, the brain case. And so by doing uh, CAT scans, we can reconstruct the 3D geometry of the brain. So this is a comparison here of a crow, a human, and a T-Rex. You see the relative size of the brains. Uh, birds get sort of a bad reputation, uh, bird brained. Birds are actually quite intelligent. You see the relative size of the brain to their head. Uh, you see, obviously, we are the smartest animal ever due to our big old brains. Uh, you see the relative size of our brains. The entire skull is kind of designed around supporting this brain. Uh, and you see T-Rex is a little bit different. Uh, we'll talk about how different in a second. But uh, if we want to know about dinosaur senses, we can look at dinosaur brains. Uh, you can see the olfactory bulb here. You can see some of the ear, ear structures. Uh, you can see the optic lobe here. This is how we can kind of take guesses at dinosaur senses. So let's start with vision. So uh, the optical lobe size, location, and structure of the eyes provides clues on vision. Uh, we can also use phylogenetic bracketing. So if we look at, again, more basal crocodiles, more derived birds, dinosaurs fall in between. Um, birds have four to five color receptors, cones, uh, in their eyes, whereas humans only have three, the RGB color receptors. Uh, most mammals only have two. Uh, so dinosaurs probably had four to five cones like birds do since they're so closely related, uh, which actually says that they probably saw color better than even we do. Uh, another hint is the sclerotic ring, this uh, bony, these bony little plates that are actually inside the eye. Uh, here's the eye cutaway. You can see the actual bones in here. They help maintain the eye's shape. They kind of act like the aperture on a camera, although the uh, cornea uh, restricts some too as well. Um, the size of this opening can hint at diurnal or nocturnal or crepuscular, like active at dawn and dusk, or cathemeral, which is just kind of active whenever they should be. Uh, this is a velociraptor skull here. Uh, you can see the eye opening here. A lot of people want to put the eye in here. Uh, that's kind of the, the sinus opening. Uh, the eye goes in this hole here, uh, and you can see the other openings behind the eye, the diapsids openings. Uh, but you can see the sclerotic ring here with this very wide opening. Velociraptors were probably nocturnal hunters. Uh, again, you can see like, again, T-Rex eye, not, not this hole. That's where the sinuses go. The two openings behind the eye and then the eye itself, the optical opening. Um, so how well could they see? Well, uh, so visual acuity and depth perception is really controlled a lot by the animal's field of view. So how much do the images from both eyes kind of overlap, where the left eye and the right eye overlap, uh, binocular vision sort of, so in this area here where the left and right overlap, uh, you get increased focus. Uh, you can also perceive depth. So like if you close one eye, it's really hard to, you get like a flatter image. It's really hard to kind of tell how far away things are. Uh, and then there's the peripheral vision, which is kind of one eye only, uh, really good at detecting motion. It provides like a very crude image, really kind of light and shadow, but it's enough to kind of see what's going on. Uh, you see that there's this major difference between predators and prey, where predators are much more focused forward. Prey is much more off to the side. Uh, what were dinosaurs like? Well, uh, let's construct T-Rex here. So this is a model where they've kind of restored T-Rex eyes. T-Rex eyes were about the size of a softball. Uh, and they said that um, out in front, they've got about a 55 degree 
view of binocular vision, that overlap there, which is pretty comparable to modern raptors, modern birds of prey. And we often say like, you've got eyes like an eagle or you're a hawkeye. Uh, birds of prey see really well. Tyrannosaurus rex in particular probably saw about very similarly uh, and saw color probably better than we do. That Jurassic Park scene where they're like, oh, hold still, he won't be able to see you. Uh, that's probably not true based on this. Tyrannosaurus probably had really good vision, very good vision. Uh, what about smell? So if we want to know about smell, we need to look at the olfactory bulb in the brain. Again, the bigger the olfactory bulb, the relative size of the olfactory bulb, the better it probably processed smell. So uh, T-Rex had a ratio that's similar to vultures, and vultures are really good at smelling. They smell out dead animals, dead rotting carcasses from kilometers away. T-Rex was probably very similar based on the sizes. Uh, the olfactory lobe is also enlarged, uh, even in herbivore dinosaurs, which probably indicates that smell was kind of important to them. So this is, again, increasing olfactory bulb size versus increasing body size. Uh, dinosaurs kind of plot in here kind of with some of the other birds. Uh, smell was probably very important. We saw earlier with the cloaca there that scent glands were probably important. They were probably communicating a lot with smell. Uh, what about sound? So the relative shapes and sizes of the inner ear and the cochlear duct make inferences on hearing. So uh, size of the size of these organs correlate with how well they probably heard. Uh, so dinosaurs didn't really have external ears. So like modern birds and crocodiles, they don't have the soft tissue ears. Dinosaurs probably didn't either. Um, but this inner ear is responsible for hearing. And what we see is that in the herbivores, the cochlear duct here is really short. And so they probably weren't great at hearing, probably like only really kind of like low frequency, like bass, like deep sounds. Uh, whereas in T-Rex, again, a very long uh, cochlear duct. And so they probably had much better hearing, uh, especially T-Rex. And so the carnivores were probably more attuned with their hearing but more in tune with their sight, which again is a pattern that we see in modern carnivores as well. Uh, what about, so what did they sound like? Well, uh, again, if we want to know what dinosaurs sounded like, we can use phylogenetic bracketing. Crocodiles, birds. What noises do crocodiles make? What noises do birds make? The kind of noises that both of them probably make, or some of each, a mixture of both. Uh, is probably what dinosaurs did. So uh, both birds and crocodiles have a lot of what's called uh, closed mouth vocalizations. So in pop culture references, particularly in Jurassic Park, you often see the big dinosaurs like Rah! mouth open, roaring like a carnivore, like a lion, like a tiger, uh, like a bear. Uh, that's probably not what they did. So their ears, are, especially the herbivores, are designed to detect low frequencies. So these are like deep guttural bass sounds. Uh, their respiratory tracts are also elongated and specialized to make these particular sounds. Uh, they travel very well over long distances. They travel through obstacles very well. Uh, but dinosaurs probably were more like booming and hooting and cooing like pigeons or the bellow roar rumble of, of a crocodile. Uh, you see when the crocodile actually does this guttural thing, it, it, it sounds a little bit like a roar. Uh, there's a YouTube video here so you can hear it, uh, but their mouth doesn't actually open. And you can actually see that they're vibrating so much that the water actually kind of shimmers around it. Uh, it's this kind of guttural, deep kind of noise. And it, it, you can hear it and you can also kind of feel it. Uh, in many ways, that deep bass is more intimidating than the open mouth roar, except you don't get quite a good view of the teeth but he probably had big lips covering these teeth too. So, uh, so what about dinosaur intelligence? Uh, one of the big themes in the discussion board was like, uh, how smart are dinosaurs? How coordinated were they? Uh, obviously like Jurassic Park made a big deal about the Velociraptor being clever girl and hunting as packs in tandem and coordination. Uh, that requires a lot of intelligence, a lot of communication. So how do we figure that out? Well, uh, in general, 
uh, overall intelligence of animals is linked to their brain size uh, relative to their body size. So here's a plot of brain mass versus body mass. Uh, what we see is that there's kind of two distinct curves here. There's kind of this upper curve. I just kind of plotted in the best fit line here. It may or may or may not be exactly right, but close. You can see the trend. Uh, there's another one down here, a different curve. Uh, Tyrannosaurus plots a little bit above that curve, kind of intermediate almost between the two. And some of the herbivorous dinosaurs plot below it. Um, so Tyrannosaurus is a little bit larger brain than we would expect for this curve. And these are a little bit smaller brain than we would expect for these curves. It's actually a logarithmic, so it's substantially smaller than we would expect. Uh, but again, what we see is there's two different curves. The upper curve tends to be more of the endothermic, warm-blooded animals. Humans, dolphins, chimpanzees plot above the curve. Some of the smarter animals. Uh, here's the cold-blooded curve. Some of the smarter animals, like perhaps Tyrannosaurus, would plot above it. Some of the not-so-smart animals would plot below it. Um, so sauropods had pretty small brains. You can see here, uh, that's a sauropod brain versus a theropod carnivore brain. You can see the relative sizes here. Uh, but just think about how hard it is to assess human intelligence. Uh, what about other living animals? The mirror test is something we use. Octopi are incredibly intelligent. They're capable of really advanced problem solving. But um, it's very hard for us to quantify even human intelligence and living animal intelligence that we can directly test. Uh, in a lot of ways, birds are very smart. Crows are good at solving problems as well. Uh, kookaburras are really smart birds. They do all kinds of crazy problem solving. Uh, and the last slide here is that in addition to the physiology, there's also this other side with the pathology. Uh, even though dinosaurs were these big mighty beings known for their big size, uh, dinosaurs probably suffered from the impacts of little parasites and bugs too. So Sue, uh, one of the more famous Tyrannosaurus specimens has these odd lesions in the jawbone, uh, probably related to trichomonosis infection, which happens in modern birds as well. So uh, it might even be what she actually died of. And so this mighty T. rex carnivore, the apex predator of basically all time on land, uh, was felled by maybe this microscopic protist uh, infection. So. Uh, keep that in mind. Also evidence of very large fleas that were infesting feathered dinosaurs. And there's also evidence of intestinal parasites from the coprolites. So uh, dinosaurs lived uh, very similar lifestyles to a lot of organisms today, and they probably died in ways that, uh, that modern animals die today. Uh, that's all we got time for today. So I hope you enjoyed that, and goodbye.